Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well today I am taking another uh, request that many of you have made uh, about a recent video and it's uh, called World War I Every Day with Army Sizes by a channel called Italian Mapper. Uh, I, this is one of those videos I would not have even known about or this channel had it not been for all the comments I was getting. I do read every single comment on every single video and there are hundreds of them every single day uh, on the channel so I appreciate those comments please keep them coming I love the recommendations you don't have to be a patron or a member to make recommendations and requests um, so thank you for those who made that request we've done a similar video called World War II with Army Sizes it's, uh, it's again a unique lens through which to look at historic events in this case using the map itself and what can we learn from how many men are on the various fronts that can tell us something about what's happening there. So uh, as we dive into this one, as always, the link will be in the description to the original content so you can check it out and see his other content as well. Uh, I want to give a thank you to Jeff Reason in Clarington, Ontario. Thank you, Jeff, so much for your support on Patreon. We could not do it without you. Let's go ahead and dive into this one. So here we have the map, and uh, we're mostly looking at Europe. That's where the vast majority of the major fighting is going to take place. Not exclusively. Uh, we have fighting. A lot of fighting happens in Africa. You're going to have fighting in parts of Asia, uh, the Middle East. You're going to have naval combat uh, in the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, all of it. But it starts with the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Serbia. And surprisingly, as you look at this map, right as we get started on the 28th of July, 1914, uh, the numbers are not all that dissimilar on this front. And we have to keep in mind that when we see numbers for, the f for a particular front, the Western Front, the Balkan Front, the Italian Front, the Eastern Front, whatever it might be, uh, that only a fraction of that number of men are actually on the front lines fighting at any given time. You're rotating men off the front lines. Uh, you have service personnel, cooks, supply officers, uh, general staff, headquarters, uh, truck drivers, artillery, all this stuff that goes into making an army work. So only a, a small percentage of your number is actually in the trenches on the front lines. Of course, at this point, there are no trenches. So uh, I'm going to let this play. It's about a 10-minute video. So uh, boom, 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 boom. I'll pause every so often as needed. Russia enters the war uh, on the side of Serbia, which triggers France, who has an alliance commitment with the Russians. Uh, Germany, of course, is allied with the Austro-Hungarians, and it's because of the German alliance that Austro-Hungary even feels confident in declaring war on Serbia, because everybody knows that's bringing the Russians in. Uh, and the UK, however, not necessarily guaranteed to come in, but... Uh, the Germans are going to execute this very famous plan called the Schlieffen Plan, which had been developed a decade or more before. And there's some debate about how much it was really followed. But the gist of the plan was, in order to fight a two-front war, you have to very quickly knock France out of the war and then rush as many of those divisions as you can to the Eastern Front to take on the bigger menace in Russia, who's big and slow and is going to take time to mobilize. Well, they mobilize a lot faster than everybody expected. Uh, but they, they have to go through Belgium to do this. And the UK is treaty bound to enter a war if Belgium is attacked. And so that's what happens. And so right off the bat, you see France and Germany are pretty much identical at this point. Um, but what happens is the Germans, and I'm actually, I think what I'll do here is I'll actually just slow down the playback speed uh, and then just kind of talk as things are going. So I'm going to have the sound off for this anyway. Um, it takes the Germans way longer to get through Belgium than they expected. The Belgians put up a stiff resistance, especially at places like Liège, which slows down Germany's ability to get through, slows down their ability to move supplies. Um but eventually they make their way through. And right here, you're getting into September 1914. You can see how far Germany has pushed. They're, they're darn near within sight of Paris. And that's where probably the most decisive battle of the Western Front is going to take place. The first battle of the Marne, 
where the French are going to stop the Germans. because And there are some tactical mistakes that are made on each side that go into that. Uh, but uh, Germany's not able to do this. And for some in the German high command, the war is lost at this point. If they can't take France and knock them out of the war instantly, they can't win a protracted, long, drawn-out war. Uh, but now you see the numbers are starting to build on the Eastern Front. Uh, the Russians are being pushed back a little bit. It says Germans reach Warsaw, but the Russian army counters the offensive. Uh, the biggest headache for Austria-Hungary right now is they can't deal with the Serbians. They're just struggling against this tiny little country in Serbia. Now the Ottoman Empire is going to enter the war on the side of the Central Powers. You can see why they're called the Central Powers. At this point, Germany's got 3 million men on the Western Front. They've also got hundreds of thousands of men on the Eastern Front because Austro-Hungary just can't do this by themselves. They're just not strong enough. They don't have the manpower. They don't have the, the, the weaponry to be able to do this. But the Ottomans are going to open up this other front uh, for the Russians. Uh, but they're also fighting down here in what is today Gaza. Uh, they're fighting over here in modern-day Iraq. Uh, so they're having to deal with all of that stuff. Numbers are going to continue to climb uh, because more and more men are being mobilized. Most of these countries have a standing army, but they have a lot of reserves. Uh, so now we are up to the Christmas truce. By this point, uh, trench warfare has kind of set in all the way from the uh, English Channel, the North Sea, all the way down to the border with Switzerland. And I should mention here that I'm going to use the term allies to refer to that group that includes France, the UK, Russia, Serbia, and eventually others like the United States and Italy. Uh, they were early on known as the Triple Entente because uh, originally there was something called the Triple Alliance, which was Germany, uh, Italy, and Austria-Hungary. But that isn't part of this war. That was earlier, a decade or so before. Uh, so we have the Central Powers and the Allies. Those are the terms I'll use. Allies was the term that was often used to refer to them, especially later on in the war. So, uh, so at this point, things have pretty well stabilized on the Western Front. You can see just a tiny sliver of Belgium that is still in Allied control. Most of the country, including a, a nice chunk of France as well, uh, are controlled by the Germans at this point. So now... The UK is going to start mobilizing a massive volunteer army. Up until this point, they're a pretty small, professional, uh, regular army force. But most of their regular army is going to be wiped out on the Western Front in 1914 at places like Ypres. Uh, and so they're going to start ra raising these what are called service battalions. They're, they're going to be known as the PALS battalions. Uh, and so at this point, you can see massive manpower advantage for the Germans on the Western Front. Things are pretty even on the Eastern Front, uh, but the Germans are going to start pushing back. They've won the battle um, at, uh, oh gosh, what's the name of the place now? This is what happens when I do these things. I can't remember the names uh, of uh, battles and things like that uh, on the fly like this. But uh, pretty well stabilized. You can see the numbers going down for the Germans, going up for the Allies, because the Allies are... Um, building more and more up. British forces launched an offensive against the Germans at Neuve Chapelle. Um, but that's not going particularly well for either side. Uh, for the most part, uh, as you get into 1915, Germany is digging in. They control Allied territory. Uh, the Allies, the, the impetus is on the Allies on the Western Front to attack. And so the Germans are digging in, and they're digging in strong. They, have, they tend to have better trenches, more developed. Uh, they'll have electric lighting and beds and all kinds of stuff built down into these barracks underground. Uh, Austro-Hungarians -Hungarian, are still really struggling with Serbia. Second Battle of Ypres in April of 1915, you're going to have the first use of poison gas, uh, gas that can actually kill or maim. Uh, and it's actually going to be so effective that the Germans don't know what to do. It's kind of a test run. Uh, the, the agreement that had been signed in the years before the war said that they wouldn't use gas-filled artillery shells. So they don't do that. They just open up the canisters and let the wind carry it across. It puts this huge gap in the Allied line uh, that is only barely held onto because 
some Canadians rush into the gap and fight this like midnight battle to hold the line. And throughout the war, the Canadians are going to be some of the best troops on either side. Um, things not changing too much on the Eastern Front. Italy has joined the war. And you're going to have like more than a dozen battles fought along the Asanzo River. You're going to have the first battle of the Asanzo and second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth. And they're fighting up in the Alps. And it's this crazy place to, to fight a war. And at times they will use the artillery to dislodge snow and cause avalanches to collapse down on the other side. Uh, it's just a nasty place to fight a war. And you can see still about a million man advantage on the Western Front for the Germans. Uh, you've got Gallipoli happening here. Uh, it's kind of the brainchild of Winston Churchill, who's first Lord of the Admiralty. They're going to send in these battleships to try and uh, shell the um, Central Powers positions. And uh, it's just a disaster. Uh, the landings do not go well. Lusitania is sunk. Um, over here right off the coast of Ireland. And it goes down really fast. Uh, Germans are really now pushing. You can see uh, Germans still have a, a almost a million man advantage on the Western Front. They're outnumbered by almost a million men on the Eastern Front. And it's not just the Germans, Austro-Hungarians obviously too. Uh, but the Eastern Front is where the movement is happening. The Russians are being pushed back. Uh, we're into August of 1950 now. Third battle of Asanzo happening on the Italian front. Uh, Italians, again, have the numbers, but they're not able to really... You're not going to see much change happen on either side. Germany uh, launches an offensive to capture Minsk. We're into September 1915 now. The numbers are starting to equalize a little bit more on the Western front and on the Eastern front as well. But now the, the Russians are going to push back uh, in this little salient that existed there. Uh, but here we go. Uh, now your uh, Austro-Hungarian and Bulgarian forces begin the occupation of Serbia. Uh, when Bulgaria enters the war, it turns the tide. Uh, what Austro-Hungarians couldn't do by themselves, very quickly now, the Bulgarians are going to be able to cause uh, a collapse of the Serbians. Serbia is going to lose a huge chunk of their uh, adult male population in this war. You can see they're nearly collapsing. But then, of course, Romania is going to enter the war, and that's going to cause another shift in what happens here. British government is issues the Mesopotamia Commission report detailing the failures of the campaign. Do you think? Yeah, major failures in that campaign. Uh, so we're getting into late November 1915. At this point, there's starting to be plans put in place for a joint British and French offensive to happen in 1916 uh, at the Somme. Why the Somme? Well, if you, if you think of this, and this is an oversimplification of what's happening on the Western Front, but basically you have Belgium on the extreme left, you have the British and Commonwealth forces, and then you have the French holding most of the rest of the line. Like I said, it's an oversimplification. There are other places where um, they're kind of plugged in here and there, but by and large, that's the case. And so the Somme River right up in here is where the German and or where the French and British armies come together. And so it's in the place where they're going to launch the offensive. The British don't even want the offensive to be there. They would rather the offensive be at the Ypres salient. That's where they feel it would be most effective. But they agree to that. Um, but it's all going to be thrown off by uh, a German offensive that's going to happen in February of 1916 at Verdun, which is over in this area. Uh, Eric von Falkenhayn is the German commander on the Western Front. And this is going to be kind of his baby. And uh, now you can see at this point, whatever whatever advantages the Germans had in manpower on the Western Front is gone by 1916. The numbers are almost identical. The Germans would have been better off to launch this offensive in 1915 if they could have, uh, but they're just not able to do that. Numbers continue to go up on both sides, um, but it's evened out somewhat on the Western Front. Eastern Front still a big advantage for the Russians, but that's negated by the fact that the Germans have basically the best army in the world. 
uh, and the Germans are able to take on multiple opponents like they are because they have the best army in the world. So now uh, you see Serbia is pretty much out of the war at this point. There, there are going to be some forces that escape and live to fight another day, kind of like what you have in World War II where you've got like Polish forces that fight throughout the war despite the fact that Poland's been overrun by the Axis powers. Uh, Germany announces the resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare around the British Isles. So uh, one of the most important factors in the defeat of the central powers specific. And listen, when I say the central powers, I'm mainly going to focus on Germany because Germany is doing all the heavy lifting for the central powers. I, I don't want to completely discount what Austro-Hungary and the Ottomans are doing, but Germany is doing the heavy lifting for the central powers. Uh, so we're mainly focused on them, mainly focused on the Western Front, just because that's what I know the best. Um, doesn't make the other fronts any less important. But uh, one of the major factors in bringing Germany down is a Allied blockade of German ports. Uh, the British don't have a huge army at the start of the war, but they do have the most powerful navy in the world, and they're going to use that. Uh, rule Britannia, rule the waves. Uh, so they're going to blockade German ports. It's going to make it very difficult for Germany to import all of the supplies they need. They've got the most powerful army in the world, the best army in the world, but they don't have enough on their own to feed and sustain their army. So they've got to import a lot. And uh, so they're counter to that because they can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the, the British Army. There had been kind of this naval arms race in the, late, the years leading up to the war. Uh, and you have one battle at Jutland off the coast of Denmark uh, where some ships are going to be sunk. But by and large, the Germans are going to basically keep their their navy and port for most of it uh, but they do have u-boat technology these untersea boats these submarines and they're going to use those and so they're going to impose their own form of a blockade on british ports and what that is is basically they're going to kind of create this zone around the british isles and they're going to say any ships that enter this zone are fair game be warned and they're warning. They're running ads in places like New York City, warning people if you get on a ship that is bound for this zone, uh, going to, say, Liverpool or to Portsmouth or to Queenstown, uh, understand we may sink you. Unrestricted submarine warfare is what that's called. And so the Lusitania, for example, it's a passenger liner, but it's carrying munitions and supplies for the British Army. Uh, and so it's sunk by this unrestricted submarine warfare. Um, and it's going to be the resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare in 1917 that's going to be one of the major factors that brings the United States into the war. All right, so Verdun, one of the deadliest and most horrific battles in human history, is unfolding in Verdun, uh, this heavily fortified uh, French city that's on the border. Uh, you have Peru join. I mean Peru, Portugal joining the war now, and one by one, new powers are joining the war here and there. Uh, British Royal Flying Corps conducts its first strategic bombing raid of World War One. Uh, the Germans are bombing cities in London. It's like the Blitz in World War Two. Cities in the UK. Uh, so like London is getting bombed. It's it's airships. It's uh, you know. Think of the Hindenburg, but in World War One, airships are going to drop bombs, and then they're going to create these big uh, airplanes, these Gotha bombers that are going to attack. And uh, of course, it's it's kind of an interesting thing when the bombers from Germany are called Gotha bombers, and Gotha is actually part of the name of the British royal family. They are the house of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha. It's German. They're going to change the name to the House of Windsor during the war because of the outcry against this German name. And the British royal family are going to be one of the few that survive World War I intact. The Germans are going to lose their uh, empire uh, and their royal family. The Austro-Hungarian Empire is going to be eliminated. The Russian Empire is going to, uh, going to be eliminated. Uh, the Ottoman Empire is going to be eliminated. So all these empires are going to fall. Easter rising in Ireland, so you have uh, 
You have internal struggles that the British are dealing with, with the Easter Rising in Ireland. Uh, the Russians are going to start dealing with internal struggles. Uh, Verdun is continuing on. France is rotating pretty much every part of their army through the Verdun sector uh, while uh, also trying to cover other parts. There's the Battle of Jutland. Not a lot of fighting going on in the Balkans at this point, very little. Um, but you have fighting in Africa, continued fighting on the Italian front, Arab revolts in the Ottoman territory. So again, internal struggles. Lawrence of Arabia is going to help kind of raise up these Arab revolts. Uh, so all of these places have internal struggles happening. The French are going to have mutinies happening in their army later on in the war. Uh, so pretty much every country is dealing not only with the, the war, but internal fighting as well. Battle of the Somme begins. 19,000 British dead on the very first day, July 1st, 1916. It's the deadliest day in the history of the British Empire. It is not the deadliest day of the war. The French are going to lose about 50% more killed than that in one day in August of 1914 during the Battle of the Frontiers. Uh, Brusilov offensive on the Eastern Front with the Russians now pushing back. Uh, and that was kind of all going on at the same time. Verdun, the Somme, the Brusilov offensive, all happening at the same time. Some of the worst fighting of the war is going on. So we're into August of 1916 now. The Somme continues all the way into November. Uh, when things are going to kind of settle down, you'll see that they've taken a little bit of territory. But by and large... Uh, the Western Front, the borders, at least when you're looking at it from this far up, aren't going to change all that much uh, during the war. Until 1918, you're going to see some big swings happen. Uh, now Romania has entered the war on the side of the Entente, the Allies. They want to take Transylvania. It does not go well for the Romanians. Romania sees some initial gains, but then the Bulgarians are going to come in and say, boom, no, it's not happening. Uh, and, and so now you see five million on the west or on the eastern front for the Allies. The Germans and the Austro-Hungarians are outnumbered two to one on the eastern front. But that's not going to stop them from basically eliminating the Allied threat on the eastern front. Battle of Fleur Corselet, the first use of tanks. Uh, Fleur Corselet, that's part of the Somme offensive. That's all part of the, what we call the Battle of the Somme. Uh, German submarine warfare continues. Now you see Romania is collapsing. The Somme uh, comes to a close. Uh, that will actually end with some offensives in November of 1916, not really October. Um, but now the Germans have an advantage again on the, on the Western Front. Slight one, but watch how much the numbers are collapsing on the Eastern Front. It was over 5 million not long ago. Now it's down to 4.5 million. It's going to collapse even more. Britannic sinks in the Aegean Sea after hitting a mine. Uh, that is a sister ship to the Titanic. It's, a, I believe, a hospital ship. Uh, total collapse for Romania on the Eastern Front. David Lloyd George, who's Welsh, becomes prime minister in the UK. Uh, look at those numbers just collapsing on the Eastern Front. Uh, going to get into 1917, and we're going to see Russia start to fall out of the war as their internal struggles come to a head. Uh, the Tsar in Russia is going to abdicate, and you're going to have a, a new government come in. The Zimmerman telegram sent to Mexico uh, against the USA. So a couple of things are happening now as we get into 1917. Germany's resuming unrestricted submarine warfare. Uh, they see a window of opportunity as the Russian front collapses for the Russians. Uh, and they're going to see an opportunity here uh, to maybe win the war before what they believe is the inevitable entry of the United States on the side of the Allies. And so with the Allied uh, entry into the war for the Americans, the Germans are looking for ways to keep America occupied. So what do they do? They send a message to their ambassador uh, in Mexico City saying, hey, tell the Mexicans if they will jump in the war on our side, 
we'll make sure they get all the territory back that they lost to the United States in the 19th century. We're talking California, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, those areas. Uh, remember, it hasn't been that many decades since that was Mexican territory. Um, and, and so uh, Mexico has also just gone through a civil war of its own. There have been some conflicts with the United States. In fact, John Pershing, who's going to be the American uh, Expeditionary Forces commander on the Western Front in Europe, uh, had led what was called the um, Mexican Punitive Expedition, which was this expedition into Mexico to try and capture this bandit Pancho Villa. It involves Pershing. It involves George S. Patton, who's on Pershing's staff. So anti-German sentiment grows stronger in the United States. Remember that the United States is a nation of immigrants, and there's no greater immigrant population in the United States than German Americans. And so it wasn't a foregone conclusion the United States would enter on the side of the Allies. But as propaganda plays out, the evil Germans, they committed atrocities in, in Belgium. They are the first to use poison gas on the Western Front. They are sinking uh, ships that have Americans on them like the Lusitania. They're the bad guys in this war. That's how this is all spun. Uh, so now you're down to just 3.7 million on the Eastern Front. February Revolution occurs in Petrograd, uh, which is later going to be called Leningrad, St. Petersburg. Um, so the Russians are at this point going to start ceasing to be an effective military force on the Eastern Front. Uh, so now the Russians uh, are collapsing. There's, uh, again, a advantage for the Germans uh, on the Western Front. But as you get into the summer of 1917, the British are going to launch a major offensive at Ypres that is going to come to be known as the Third Battle of Ypres, but most people remember it as Passchendaele. Passchendaele Ridge is kind of the final objective for the British in this summer offensive that's going to take them into the fall. French offensives end in complete disaster on the Western Front. All during all of this, you have turnover uh, in the Allied High Command. Uh, General French for the British is going to be replaced by, um, by another general named uh, Sir Douglas Haig. Uh, the German commanders at this point uh, it starts out as Moltke, and then it's going to be Falkenhayn in the fall of 1914. And then when Falkenhayn fails to uh, win the Battle of Verdun, he's going to be replaced by uh, the heroes of the Eastern Front, uh, which are Hindenburg and Ludendorff, who are going to come to the West uh, to take on uh, the, the Allies. Uh, Robert Nouvelle is replaced uh, as commander of the French army after military failures. Eventually, you're going to get Ferdinand Foch, who's going to be the not only the French high command, but the Allied commander. He's going to be the Eisenhower of the Western Front in command of all Allied forces. So uh, the Ottomans are going to start to collapse as well. Greece enters the war on the side of the Allies. Again, very little has changed on the Italian front during all of this. Lawrence of Arabia leads the Arab revolts and the capture of the Ottoman port of Aqaba. So now you see from what was over 5 million on the Eastern Front is now just 2.8 million. 1917, July 1917, uh, you're going to have the execution of... Um, I think it's July 1917, the execution of Tsar Nicholas and his family. Now, I had to pause and think about that. It's July of 1918 is when that happens. Uh, Third Battle of Ypres uh, is the offensive that is launched by the Allies. starts with Messine Ridge, which is this massive explosion of mines on the Western Front. The largest mine explosions at one time that we're going to see during the entire war. So both sides, the numbers are weighed down all the way along all these fronts. You've got millions and millions of casualties by this point. Every one of these major offensives is going to be like the cause of a million or more casualties. 
Small territorial gains on the Western Front. You're, uh, September into October, early November, the Allies are going to finally capture Passchendaele Ridge, but horrendous casualties in doing so. It's like a million casualties on the two sides uh, for the Third Battle of Ypres. Uh, at this point, though, the, the Russians are basically out of the war, down to 2.2 million. Uh, but a lot of what you're seeing here is not de necessarily killed and wounded. It's a lot of guys that are just done. And they're like, I'm out, I'm going home, I'm not fighting anymore on the Eastern Front. Uh, Caporetto results in a total Italian catastrophe. Uh, now, for the first time, you see the numbers almost equalized on the Italian Front. Uh, now, civil war in Russia. Russia's out of the war at this point. So here's what's going to happen now. At this point, there's this window of opportunity for the Germans. The Germans, once they don't have to deal with Russia anymore, they're going to load up like 50 divisions from the Eastern Front. They're going to send them to the West. At this point, the United States has entered the war. They declare war in April of 1917. But it's not going to be until like the summer of 1918 that the U.S. is on the Western Front in any big numbers. So there's that window where Russia's out, but the U.S. hasn't shown up yet in big numbers. And so this major spring offensive is planned by the Germans. Uh, it's, it's sometimes called the Kaiserschlacht Offensive. It's known as the Spring Offensive, the Ludendorff Offensive. It's actually a series of offensives. There's like Operation Michael and Operation Georgette and Blucher York. And uh, this is meant to break the back of the Allies. So here's what they're going to do. Again, remember I said Belgians and, and uh, British and Commonwealth forces. And when I say Commonwealth forces, I mean the Canadians, the Australians, the New Zealanders, the South Africans. There's Indians on the Western Front, uh, people from the Caribbean, all of this stuff. The French have Moroccans and Algerians and others. Uh, so they're going to try to bust through uh, that area where the British and the French come together. So they're launching an offensive at the Somme. They're, it's an offensive at Ypres. Uh, it's all of these places. And they're going to try to drive the British out of the war. You drive the British out of the war, the French aren't going to hold. The French are on the verge of collapse themselves. They've had mutinies. Uh, it's not going well for anybody. Uh, but what happens is that, uh, again, they're stopped at, at the Battle of the Marne. And that's where you're going to have the Americans make a name for themselves at places like Bellow Wood. Uh, you're going to have the 3rd Infantry Division for the Americans at the Marne River. Uh, they're actually going to be known forever after this as the Rock of the Marne Division. Uh, but again, it's mostly the French and the British that are doing the heavy lifting here. Uh, so Germans take a bunch of territory. And they get some really uh, positive concessions for themselves. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk is going to end the war on the Eastern Front. But the, the Germans have already sent most of these, most of these men to the West uh, to try and win the war before the Americans arrive. Now, get a glimpse right here real quick. You're down substantially on the Western Front, right? There had been five six seven million men fighting on the western front now you're less than three million at this point because uh, the casualties and the attrition are just that severe uh, so you're gonna see german gains in april and may of 1918 the war in the east is basically over the war in the balkans is still going on the war uh, in the italian front is still going on but now watch the numbers in april 1918 Allied numbers going down substantially. German numbers going down substantially. The Finnish Civil War ends uh, up here. Uh, so that's happening. Allies at this point are down to almost only a million men. But now the Americans are showing up. Now the numbers start climbing again on both sides. Watch the line. The Germans are going are gonna to push the line forward here in May and June, but it's only temporary. But now the numbers are starting to climb again on both sides. You can see the Ottomans make some pushes forward, but basically they're going to collapse. Here comes the, the last gasp of the German army, June of 1918. 
They're going to once again get super close to Paris, but once again be stopped at the Marne. They're going to be stopped at Chateau Thierry at places like that. Um, now the uh, the Allies are going to launch what's called the Hundred Days Offensive. When the when the German offensive runs out of gas, now it's going to be a counter offensive by the Allies. The Hundred Days Offensive. You're going to have um, the Americans launch their first attack at Saint Mihiel down here on the the right flank. Uh, for the first time since all of this began. There's a numerical advantage for the Allies on the Western Front. That's a combination of the Germans running out of steam and exhausting their last reserves. It's the Americans arriving in huge numbers. So 1914 and 1918, both times the Germans get as close as they're ever going to get to Paris, but they're stopped at the Marne River, and now Allied counterattacks are going to finish off the Germans, and the Germans are just going to collapse. Now watch as it pushes forward. Meuse Argonne is down here. It's going to be a south to north offensive. It's the largest battle in the history of the American armed forces. Um, about a million Americans are going to take part in this offensive. And the Germans are done. By September of 1918, the German high command knows they're done. And they're starting to talk peace. They're going to start talking about what can we do to get the most favorable terms possible. Look at this now. From having a major manpower advantage, as many as a million earlier in the war, now they're outnumbered significantly on the Western Front. They only have a million on the Western Front. And the war at this point is basically over for the Germans. So they're, they're going to negotiate an armistice in late October, it's going to be finalized in November. And the last day of the war, November 11th, 1918, uh, the armistice is going to be signed around 5 a.m., uh, but fighting is going to continue all morning. The Allies are going to push and push and push and try to take a little bit more territory on that last day. And now you can see uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire is collapsing. These... All these territories, they're out of the war. Now it's just Germany at this point. Armistice of Campania is signed. And that's it. That's the end of the war. I missed a lot. I was just trying to kind of talk about some of the highlights. And you can just see how there were definitely opportunities in there for the, for the Germans to win at different times. So let me know your thoughts. Uh, what are some other things that you noticed that maybe I didn't highlight? Because I was, you know, obviously my eyes are only focused on one area at any given time. So were there other things that you mentioned I didn't, you observed that I didn't mention that you think are worth highlighting in looking at all of that? Let me know. I want to thank Ted Komet and Jason Hughes. Jason's from New Lenox, Illinois. Thank you guys for your support on Patreon. Could not do it without you. Uh, please check out my channel, Stories of the Great War. It is a completely dedicated to World War I history uh, channel. All original content. I'm going to be uploading some new videos in the coming weeks on that channel as well. Hope you enjoy it. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.